uh, the important evidence on the latest Bank of England monetary policy report. So can I start, Governor, by inviting you to introduce yourself? Yes. And, uh, and uh, Andrew Bailey, the Governor of the Bank of England. Hugh. Hugh Pill, uh, I'm the Chief Economist of the Bank. Silvana. Silvana Tanreiro, Professor at the LSE and external member of the Bank of MPC. Thank you. Good morning. Jonathan Haskell, uh, Professor at uh, Imperial College and an external member of the MPC. Thank you. Thank you all very much for coming in and talking to us about uh, the current state of play. Uh, inflation is clearly still over 10% in the UK. It's five times your target. Food inflation is, I think, over 16%, which shows why inflation harms the poorest and those on fixed incomes uh, the worst. And the second round effect that you've given us evidence on in the past that were particularly, you were particularly vigilant about seem now to be everywhere that you look in the economy. There are wage pressures, uh, there are strikes, there, are, there is services inflation, uh, there seems to be a change in household inflation expectations, and now even the government has said that it just wants to see inflation halve over the course of this year, which would take it to 5% or two and a half times your target. So, Governor, do you accept that the bank has made mistakes in terms of this tightening cycle, that you started raising rates too late, uh, too slowly, and you've really let inflation run away in this country, and it will now be harder and more painful to get inflation back to target. Well, I know we've discussed this before, and I would start by saying that we can't, we don't make policy with the benefit of hindsight. I have to start with that. I'm happy, you know, I'm happy to comment on, if you like, sort of the history. And I think it's important because we obviously learn a lot from that. Mm. But I do just want to say that we, we don't have the benefit of making policy with hindsight. There have been a number of very big shocks hitting the economy over the last uh, three years, starting with COVID. I think, but I've been going, going past that. I would pick out now, you know, a number of very big shocks that have hit the economy. Uh, the first one I would pick out, and I'll roughly do them in order of appearing, was the supply chain shock that uh, appeared it, it, as the recovery from COVID started. That's a global shock, and. It was really, I certainly speak for myself now actually, it was really that shock that you know, caused us to use the term transient or transitory about the nature of it because at that point in time we really saw that as a single, a single supply side shock that was part of the recovery from COVID. I should say that if we go back to particularly somewhere like the summer of 2021, the UK economy was substantially below the level of activity that it had been pre-COVID. Of course, it is still below the level of activity pre-COVID, but at that point it was substantially below. But the reason that, you know, use, we use the, I use the term, I mean, we weren't the only central bank using the term transitory or transient, was because, you know, a single supply side sh shock like that on its own ought to work its way through the system. And what I would say now, with the benefit of having seen how things evolve, is that actually that's, that, has, that is what has happened with that shock. Probably it peaked around the end of 2021 on most measures and has now come off quite substantially. However, two other very big, or two other shocks have hit us. The very big one is Russia-Ukraine. This is the one that is, is, is you know, in a sense is, is the dominating shock of the last year. As I'm, I'm no doubt we'll come on to, it is also, however, in a sense, the, you know, the the moving on from it is also why we expect inflation to come down rapidly this year. Now, you know, we've discussed before at these hearings, I don't, you know, I don't think any of us could have predicted what was going to happen in Russia or Ukraine until quite near to it actually happening. But it is a very big shock. But it has a second effect, which I'll say, you know, I talked about the effect of single supply shocks, but what we've had is a sequence of them and there's no air gaps between them. And that, of course, makes them much more persistent. And, and much more difficult to deal with and the sort of, if you like, the sort of conventional wisdom that you can accommodate the first round effects of a single supply shock, you know, start to go out of the window at that point. The third shock is the one that, you know, we've discussed a lot before and I, you know, really take, take to be, in a sense, highly relevant to your question, which is then the question of the, of the labour supply in the UK. 
uh, you know, as we've observed and as we've commented on extensively in the monetary policy report, there has been a decline in participation in the UK. Now, many countries had a decline in participation in the sort of co initial COVID period. What sort of differentiates the UK is that it hasn't recovered. And, and this is the, the judgment. I come back to this question about judgments we had to make at the time. And, you know, I, I mean, I remember you saying, and you know, you're right on a number of occasions in the past, you could observe elements of tightening mm. going on. Um, and, and you know, our response to that, in a sense, was, yeah, we don't disagree. Our agents were, were telling us this as well. The challenge we had to deal with was that the furlough scheme was in place at that time until the end of September 2021. Around about a million jobs were, on, you know, were, were, were furloughed right until the end of the scheme. And so the big question was what was going to be the impact of ending the furlough scheme? Now, by the way, I'm not criticizing it. I think the furlough scheme did a very good job, but it, it created this problem of judging what the effect at the end of it would be. Now, we thought unemployment would rise at the end of it. By the way, I looked back at, you know, look, I look back at, if you take our August 2021 monetary policy report, we always published to, to later on in the, in the report a comparison of our projections with those of other forecasters. We were actually at the low end of, 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 of the assessment of the rise in unemployment that would follow from the end of the first scheme. But of course, it didn't happen. And, and that's the, that's the, you know, the, in many ways, I think the, you know, the important part of your, you know, assessment of where we stand now. We've got a tight labour market, very tight labour market. We've had a fall in participation and it hasn't recovered. The final thing I'll mention, which is the shock that didn't happen, was Omicron. Mm -hmm. So when we, you know, when we were considering the, the timing of the, uh, you know, of the, of the initial tightening of, of monetary policy, we were in the, right on the cusp of Omicron and we were being told it was going to happen. Um, and that's the one we look, we, yeah, we, we said, well, we think, you know, it, its effects may be less than the earlier COVID out, its economic effects may be less than the earlier COVID outbreak. So, and I think that was a correct judgment. But again, it was a, it was a very big judgment we had to make at the time. So, if you don't mind, I mean, my response to this is we have to make judgments and, you know, based on imperfect evidence at the time. We learn a lot of things afterwards, and I agree with you on that. Um, but I do push back on this question about hindsight judgment. Well, I'm going to push back on you, course, if yeah, I may, that's fine, that's uh, Governor, because I've gone back and uh, you yeah. and I have uh, discussed this mm. uh, quite regularly uh, over the last uh, few years. And uh, I want to just pick out some of the exchanges that the okay. team have highlighted, and I think you probably will have gone through them. And I'm going to start in May 2021 yeah. with your evidence there, uh, because by that time, uh, inflation had risen yes. from below target to your target of 2%. And you told us that there are some very hot spots and very hot areas of prices. Mm. And I just remark on the fact that despite that, the bank decided to keep interest rates at 0.1 yes. and to carry on with quantitative easing of our, the HUT program yes, can I, I mean, billion. Can I just put that into context yeah. of what I said? And I don't want to repeat it, but I won't. But, but that's because we were already observing the global supply chain shock taking place, and there were hot spots. Um, and there were probably there were hot spots in domestically because you know, pieces of the economy were reopening in a, you know, in, a, in, in sometimes a rather difficult fashion. Um, and the question for us was, are those going to be permanent effects or temporary transient effects? That was, that's the question. That the we judgment were you took at that point was that it would be yes. temporary. Okay. Yes. We then get to September 2021. And, and I think it's that fourth quarter yes. that I find uh, most interesting to look at, at retrospectively. Um, so by now, uh, inflation is now over your target. It's yes. at 3.1%. Uh, You're still doing the 150 billion yes. of quantitative easing at that point. Yes. We then get to uh, November 2021, and inflation is now running at 5.1%, yep. and you're saying, I'm now very uneasy about the yes. inflation situation. Of course, that is the moment when uh, the committee uh, judged that some modest tightening of monetary yep. policy uh, yep. was likely to be necessary, so didn't actually... Uh, move until a bit later Number. on in the autumn, point Number one. we moved. Yeah, yeah. So you're still at point yeah. one at, at that point. Yeah. 
Uh, and then... Um, well, I mean, can I just observe that that's precisely the point in time that I was just referring indeed. to yeah. with these two things that we were having to assess. One was the effect of the end of the furlough scheme. And, of course, I, by the way, I said it ended mm. in, at the end of September, but yeah. the data doesn't come free for yeah. another, you know, t couple of months. Yeah. And the second one is Omicron. Yeah. I mean, those are two things that were, yeah. Yeah, were very much uppermost in our mind at that yeah. point in time. I understand that. But you accept that monetary policy was kept very loose, despite the evidence that you gave us, um, is that there is, there, are, there is risk that it transfers into real pressure in terms of wage negotiation, yes. the prolong inflation, lead to higher yes, inflation because, expectations, all the things yes, that we're currently we would, seeing. We, yeah. No, I t perfectly agree with mm. you on that. Mm. And, and the, but the reason that I agree with you is because we were seeking to balance these various you know, conflicting and you know, countervailing pressures at that time and to assess what was going on in the labor market as this million uh, jobs on furlough unwound mm -hmm. uh, as to how that would, would wind its way through. And those were very difficult judgments. Um, and we concluded by December that the right thing to do was to start to tighten monetary policy. But we were still very uncertain because remember that was, mm -hmm. that was just about to mm -hmm. go into, sort of into the Omicron wave mm -hmm. at that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, so well, let's step forward then to uh, exactly a year ago uh, today. By now inflation has risen to 6.2%. Uh, interest rates are still only at 0.5 um, and your evidence at that point is to say I must say that transitory uh, was becoming a slightly overused and in some circles overused yeah. term um, you're clearly now pointing to an upside risk uh, second round effects the risk of real second round effects and yet you know, the, the, rate, the rate is still only 0.5. Well, the reason that I was made the point about transitory goes back to what I said a few, a few moments ago uh, earlier on, which is that transitory is, an, is, is a term that, in my view, it's easier to apply to a single shock. By this stage, we, of course, we're now seeing, you know, the, unfortunately, Russia's mm. invasion of Ukraine, of course, was sadly starting to happen. Though the major impact on, on, on energy prices really came over the summer, actually, uh, in terms of the impact. So we were seeking to judge what would be the impact now on more than one shock. Uh, and I also would just make the point that we were the first major central bank to, you know, to tighten monetary policy. So, you know, this was a, this was a problem and you know, a challenge that others were having as well. On that day, the day before Russia in, invaded Ukraine, inflation was already running at 6% yes. in this country. And interest rates were at 0.5. Yes. And I wonder whether it is your opinion now, not with the benefit of hindsight, because these are all contemporaneous <coughs> observations, that uh, the risk to inflation was always more to the upside than to the downside given the level of monetary policy that we had at that time. And the second well, round think, effects, the risks to those second round effects becoming embedded were very high at that moment in time. But I think we were still at that point, because of the nature of the shocks that we were dealing with and the, the question of whether they, how transitory they would be, that was the question that we were still frankly wrestling with at that point. And so these are judgments we have to make, I'm afraid. Um, yeah, we, we changed our view on that as, as we went through the summer, really. How can, how, how can people... I, 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 I do want to keep on asking the Governor. Um, how can uh, people feel confident, though, that the Bank of England has made the right judgments at the right time in this period of time? And I note that uh, in terms of uh, public polling, um, that there's now you know, quite a high level of dissatisfaction um, with the um, track record of the Bank of Well, our job is, I mean, I, I, I can quite understand the public polling because our job is to get inflation back down to targets, and I would expect, you know, the public to, uh, the public will, you know, of course, expect us to do that, and we will do it, and I would expect that that will be reflected in public polling. So at this point in time, I would, uh, I would of course, expect the public to say, what well, you know, it's your job to get inflation down to target, and my response to that is, yes, it is, and we will do it. No, actually, it's your job not to have let it get to this kind well, of level of second round effect either. Can I, well, can, I'm, I'm sorry to have to disagree on this point, but there are a very large, there's a very large body of first round effects going on at the moment. Mm -hmm. And one piece of evidence for that, we think, is that the fall that we expect to see in inflation this year, uh, which we've set out in the, in the monetary policy report, mm -hmm 
is the unwind of what we what we done called the base effects from last year. This is a very powerful unwind. Now, there's a second question, which no doubt we'll come on to, about you know, will there be persistence? But these base effects are unwinding very powerfully this year, and they will unwind more as the year goes on because of the nature of what happened last year. That, to my mind, indicates that there is a very big first round effect in here. Why? Uh, we'll get on to the second round effects because, uh, you know, 5% now is the government's own target. It wants to halve inflation this year. Uh, a lot of uh, the expectations you've set in terms of your forecast of us getting back down to that level, um, I think what worries this committee is the persistence of some of those second round effects um, uh, persisting at 5%. But I do want to well, now, yeah. I say, actually, I mean, our, uh, as you've seen from the report we published, our, our projection just, you know, indicates that inflation will probably come down below 5% by the end of this year. Um, You'll forgive the committee for being slightly sceptical of those projections, given how often we've seen those projections turn out to be incorrect. Well, it's right for you to question, question us on those, and I accept that. But what I would say is that there are really sort of two countervailing forces going on at the moment. There, is, there are very powerful... Uh, base effects that are going to come out this yeah. effect come out this year yeah. and that and that puts a very powerful negative trajectory on inflation Absolutely. unless i mean unless we we have some event in the world that we do not know about at the moment mm. and, and that's that's really down to energy a lot of that is down to energy prices now we are concerned about persistence um and we you know, that's why we frankly raised interest rates this time because you could you could justifiably say to us if you've got this view of inflation going forwards and of course we do take different views on this as you'll know and those of us at the table take different views on this mm. if you've got those powerful sort of you know downside forces why are you raising interest rates mm. again and the answer for me to that question is i'm very uncertain particularly about price setting and wage setting in this country we have got the largest upside skew on it in, in our forecast that we've mm. ever had on inflation, mm. which, which still actually leaves it coming down to target, by the way. I mean, this is stop, you know, this, otherwise it would the central case would come below target. So we do put weight on the, on, 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 the, on the persistence risk, but there are very powerful downward forces this year, other things equal. Thank you, Governor. I'm going to turn to Hugh now, and I know Silvana has a point that she wants to raise, and Jonathan as well. Um, but uh, Hugh, you've uh, very kindly uh, sent the committee uh, a sort of self-assessment of your time uh, on the committee since September 2021, and we're publishing that uh, today. And I thought what was very interesting in your uh, self-assessment is that it's slightly different from the speech and the evidence that you've given here in Parliament before, where you did uh, stress this phrase about with the benefit of hindsight uh, that we heard from the Governor just now. Because in your self-assessment questionnaire, uh, I was intrigued by your paragraph seven, because you admit that in that pivotal time that we've been talking about, the autumn 2021 uh, decision, uh, that the bank waited for the end of furlough to tighten, and yet you point in that paragraph seven to the fact that your network of agents at that time, uh, before the end of furlough, was pointing to tightness in the labour market and strength of the ability of people to negotiate increases in wages. Can you tell us a bit more about um, this assessment you've made of how you should have paid more attention to that network of agents contemporaneously? I, I think, I mean, first of all, let me say uh, the assessment of which I wrote is one which is made with the benefit of hindsight. So I am uh, assessing myself and looking back over the experience I personally have had since I joined the committee uh, in September 2021. And I think what I'm trying to write is actually very consistent with what the Governor just said, namely, um, we were given this information from the agents at that time. I think that information was published in the NPR and was part of the, what was reported in the minutes and all the usual vehicles of communication, I think, including the discussion that took place in this committee. Um, I mean, speaking from a personal self-reflection, looking back, and I think consistent with what the Governor said, we faced at that time a very specific and a very uncertain environment in the labour market associated with the coming to the end of the furlough scheme. Mm. So if you remember, as we were unwinding, or as the government's furlough scheme was coming to an mm. end, 
there had been some uncertainty earlier in the year before I joined the committee about when it would come to an end. That was largely resolved by this point, but um, in September and through uh, that period, we still had uh, roughly three quarters of a million jobs on furlough. Mm -hmm. And so the question, I think, was the tightness that was being reported from our agency network mm -hmm. um, in the labor market associated with suggestions around recruiting difficulties mm -hmm. and rising pressures and prey. Mm -hmm. Would that be eased at the moment that the furlough scheme to, came mm -hmm. to an end? And, I mean, prima facie, at least potentially, you would release quite a lot of people who are supposedly in the jobs that mm -hmm. were under the furlough scheme into the labor market. So that would have been a kind of corrective me me mechanism mm -hmm. to this tightness. And with the benefit of hindsight, of course, I look back and think, how much weight did I pla play, place on the um, reports we were getting from the agencies versus how much weight did I place on the official data which was reporting there are a lot of jobs still on furlough and therefore the potential for this evening. I think what I did at the time was think, well, we probably need to see post the end of the furlough how those close to three quarters of a million jobs that were furloughed, how that plays out in terms of both the survey data we see, the reports we get from the agents, and the official data. So data on unemployment, data on wage settlements, and so forth and so on. And I particularly put weight on the official data, which didn't come out, mm. as the Governor just said, towards the end of November and early December. And so that uh, led to a sort of view, this is a personal view, that it was worth waiting until we saw that data mm. in order to avoid making a mistake about how tight the labour market would prove to be once the furlough scheme ended. So I think labour market, official labour market data is always seen as a lagging indicator. You've got this marvellous network of agents that were telling you that the labour market was tight and, uh, you know, it, it, I wonder whether the fact that you were new to the committee meant that you didn't sort of speak up with your concerns uh, loudly enough and, uh, and, and those were contemporaneous concerns that you had. Well, I'd say to you, I mean, I was new to the committee. I don't think that precluded me from speaking up, but others are probably in a better position to judge than I am. Um, mm. And I mean, I want to make clear, and I think that was the purpose of this exercise, if I have not misjudged it, to me to give a personal reflection as an individual, independently accountable member of the MPC in the report I gave you, which you're referring to. So just to emphasize, that was a personal view. Uh, I would like to think, looking back, that I contributed to the discussion of the committee from the perspective I gave, but certainly the discussion in the committee, and I think this is what's recorded in the minutes, and I think was reported in the equivalent meeting back in November uh, and then again in February 2021, was a discussion where this was at the core. And, and the point I'd emphasize is, I mean, looking back, the reports we were getting from the agents were the labor market mm. is tight. Mm. The reports we were also getting from the agent market was there is uncertainty as mm. to how the end of the, um, yeah. the yeah. furlough scheme will play out. Mm in terms of easing that. So in other words, it wasn't just those of us on the committee who were uncertain. Mm. It was the agents, and perhaps more fundamentally, the, the corporate contacts that we were gathering the information of via the agents. So I think there was a genuine uncertainty at that point mm. as to what would be the impact in the, la in the UK labour market of the end of the furlough scheme. Again, I, I would submit that uh, just characterising this whole episode is one with with the benefit of hindsight, there was actually contemporaneous evidence that on balance you chose to wait to, um, to see whether that uh, fo followed through into you know, genuine wage pressures. And that's where the hindsight comes in, yeah, as opposed can to I, you I did have contemporaneous to, evidence. Yeah. I know yes. someone wants to come yeah. in, but can I just add one point? Because I, mm. you know, I, I just want to have a reflection of conversations that, you know, I. I you know, I do a lot of trips around the country with the agents, mm. and recent conversations, actually. I was in Wales three weeks ago, and this conversation came up with a number of businesses, going back just to that point in time that you rightly refer to. And them saying to me what they didn't expect, and this, play, this goes to the inactivity story, mm. was that their, you know, was their labor force actually mm. saying, I've reevaluated, you mm. know, 
my life as it were and I'm not going to come back to work mm. uh, and, and you know they, they're open and saying we just didn't expect that to happen mm. yeah and that's, the, that's part of the inactivity story of course yeah. okay. I'll bring in Silvana and uh, Jonathan and uh, we can talk yeah. about uh, what this information t- informs us about your future outlook in a minute uh, Silvana yeah, just, just to put the factors into perspective um, the labour market contribution uh, is very small the dominant shock in 2022 was the war in Ukraine and increase in um, uh, energy prices and other commodities, food food prices. And and that's important to keep in mind. At the 11% peak in inflation last year, eight percentage points of that was contributed by energy and other goods prices, which are largely determined in global, global markets. These are mostly tradable components. The rest, the three percentage point, came from services, um, which is more affected by domestic input costs, like wages, and, um, and obviously more influenced by monetary policy. Now, if we just follow those numbers and take that eight percentage point contribution from abroad, then to have inflation at the 2% target last year, given that services represent uh, two-fifths of the CPI basket, would have necessitated inflation in the services sectors to be minus 15%. That is, to meet the 2% target in 2022, we would have needed a services deflation of 15%. Now, In practice, of course, the split that I gave you is not precise. You can refine it. Some uh, good sectors include some non-tradable components, and monetary policy can affect uh, good sectors' inflation through other channels. And conversely, services inflation uh, contains some energy and food components in them. So this, uh, but even if you refine my calculation, The conclusion is that you still need services inflation running at deeply negative, uh, in in deeply negative territory in order to meet the 2% target. Now, as you can imagine, having deflation of 15% in services requires a massive recession, much bigger than the great financial crisis, with unemployment at two digit levels. Um, This is at the time in which the economy was trying to recover from the COVID shock. And let's not forget that consumption at the time and investment, uh, even now actually, they're still well below their 2019 levels. So in my view, it would have been incompatible with our remit to have inflation at target last year. Now, uh, I mentioned this eight percentage point contribution as we go forward to the next two two years, uh, two to three years, that eight percentage point, as those prices stabilize or even turn negative, as we've been seeing, this will become zero or negative. That means that the level of services inflation you will need to meet the target, again, with a contribution of services of roughly two-fifths, would be 5%. That's the level of services inflation we will need in the coming years to meet the inflation target. So um, if you you really want to hit target at all times, you need to go from minus 15 to five, which is an impossible task for any central bank. I mean, you cannot switch unemployment uh, from two digits. I think what what we're keen to ask you to do, and we uh, appreciate that if you're going to get a massive spike in something like energy, then uh, that that um, uh, will make it difficult to, for, to achieve 2% on a you know, day-by-day basis. We accept that. Um, but it is notable that the day before the invasion, inflation was already running at 6% uh, and that uh, the did... base rate was at half a percent so... uh, on that day. Yeah, what so, we learned, Harriet, from you know, mm. with han- hindsight, is that those uh, restrictions in uh, in gas supply had started earlier, and that was not known to us. But as I said, I think it was. Yeah, yeah, that's what yeah. I'm saying. But mm. we, di- we didn't. I mean, we di- we could see the the price effect, uh, which was not, uh, which is just the beginning of it. But we didn't know that this would be a sustained strategy by Putin. Um, uh, going forward. So, I mean, you at the time could have seen it as as a temporary. But you mentioned services inflation, and uh, in your latest report, you say that services inflation is at a new high. 
What I'm trying to press you on today is that uh, the second order effects in terms of inflation have now become much more deeply embedded in our economy and will be that much harder to remove. Let me talk uh, about that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, as I said, I mean, in order to meet the inflation target, we would need services inflation to come down with, from the current 6.8% to 5%. Is that feasible? It is, and this is what is in, in our forecast. There are three elements to that. First, services inflation does incorporate uh, some energy and food components. Some services are very intensive in the use of those. And in fact, if you look at just services that are not energy intensive, inflation there has been less than 5%. So naturally, as energy prices come down, there will be a direct slowdown in services inflation. The second component is uh, wage inflation. And we have already seen a slowdown in uh, uh, pay growth uh, in the high frequency measures. If you look at one month on one month or three months on three months, this has been falling since, since July. And then the last one, and this is, the, of course, the big one, is monetary policy. We have tightened policy significantly over the past year, and that's going to be uh, uh, to have a large impact on demand, hence the labor market, and this is going to uh, be the transmission mechanism that will ultimately bring inflation. In fact, it's going below target in our forecast, well below target. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so, so those elements should give you the reassurance that we are more than on track. I accept that there are some year-on-year -year effects that are going to roll out. Where I'm somewhat probing you here is that whether a 5% level of inflation has not become quite ingrained and embedded as a second-order effect in the UK economy. Uh, Jonathan. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, Chair, I, I, I guess I don't want to move the conversation backwards, but I just want to say two things. One is um, I think it's important if we go back to the issue around the furlough and the late 21, 2021 discussion that we were just having. Mm. I think it's important to understand, as Silvana's just said, the context in which that was the case. You, you'll have seen chart 3.7 uh, in our report on page 87 gives the level of investment over that period. Uh, and the level of investment was around 10 percentage points below the pre-Omicron le level mm -hmm. in that late uh, in that late mm -hmm. 21 period. In other words, the economy was extremely subdued. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you were to say, uh, you know, gosh, uh, you know, I want you to, to tighten monetary policy with an incredibly low level of, uh, of investment, you know, that would have, uh, uh, that, that would not normally uh, be a very good thing to do. That, that was one thing to do. And then the second thing, which also goes back to the issue, there was absolutely a lot of uncertainty around the furlough. But as Andrew just mentioned, um, we mustn't forget that Omicron was a major threat at that time as well. Could, could I just say a quick word about that? Because I think that is a case study in what we know now as mm. opposed to what we knew then. Mm. We now know mm. that the vaccine was robust against mm. Omicron, mm. but we didn't know that mm. then. We took advice from Chris Whitty, mm. you know, the best advice in the land, uh, about the situation in Omicron. And as you remember, when Omicron first came out, um, I think it was in South Africa, there was significant concern that it would indeed get past the vaccine. The vaccine would be ineffective against it. And I remember asking Chris Whitty, well, what happens then? And he told us the facts. And the facts are that the um, a vaccine would have to be re-engineered. That would take three to six months. And we would have to start vaccinating everybody all over again. Now, again, we know now <laughs> that that did not come to pass. But if you'll forgive my just dwelling on it, I think it's a little study about how we didn't know back then and we had to make policy with the benefit of what we knew at the time. So Sorry for not, that long. Are you uh, not concerned interview, now interview. that the second order inflationary effects have become much more embedded in the UK economy? So I, I am concerned that they are and that's why I'm voting to raise. But the point I'm trying to make is a slightly separate point, mm. which is... With the benefit of the with with the information we had then, mm. we didn't know that at the time, and so we did the right policy decision at the time. Okay, Anthony. Thank you, Chair. Can I do just one mm. clarification? When I mentioned five five percent services inflation, that's enough to meet the target because services is two fifths of the basket, and the other side of the basket is going, going to negative. be exactly. Yeah, I understand yeah. that. Yes, yeah. Anthony. Um, thank you, Chair. The um. 
I'm looking at the prospects of uh, inflation over the co over the coming year. Uh, mm. The bank, you declared that uh, we've now turned the corner and your projections are pretty much downhill uh, all the way. Uh, I really want to get a range of views of what the risk is to that. I mean, are there, um, is there a real risk that it won't end up going downhill the whole way? Uh, and then the second question is uh, the government, as you touched on earlier, the government has given itself its own target for inflation to halve it by the end of the year. Uh, do you think there's any risk to not meeting that? Because obviously your expectation is that it will meet that. I'm going to take a range of views. We'll start with uh, Jonathan and then uh, go right. Thanks very so, much. So is there any risk to not going downhill the whole way this year? No, th thank, thanks for the question. Uh, Anthony, well, well again, j j why don't we just refer to, refer to the report since the hearing is about the report. Um, <laughs> So on page 27, uh, we lay out this rather complicated table, so apologies, it's a complicated table, there's tons of information in it, which I think speaks to your issue. So as you say, C our projection is that CPI inflation <coughs> will go down from roughly 10 at the moment to around 4 at the end of the year. Of that, um, the energy price uh, contribution is going to take about 3 and 3 quarters. Uh, so that's a fall of 6 and 3 quarters. The energy price, uh, as I say, we publish it, you know, in black and white in the report, is going to take three and three quarters off that. We, we can have a reasonable amount of confidence about that because of the way that the off-gen price cap works uh, and, uh, and our current knowledge of what the, what the futures curve is. Now, of course, as Andrew was just saying, were there to be another significant shock, then that would imperil that. But, you know, uh, we've got to do, do the best we can, again, given the information set we know. So of that fall of six and three quarters, as I say, about three and three quarters is because of energy, there are indirect energy effects, as Silvana was just mentioning. Of course, energy has a direct effect because we buy uh, gas and electricity, but then there are indirect effects because restaurants have got to consume energy and all that sort of stuff. Add maybe, uh, you know, 0.25 to that. That's about four percentage points on that. Um, so then that takes you from 10 to roughly about six. And so the question is, where are the other two going to come from? Uh, and there, I think, um, we are being ever vigilant on that issue. That then gets one to the issue about what's going to happen in the labour market, what's going to happen to our export prices, and so on. Um, so, uh, again, without going through all the various details in the report, uh, all the numbers are there. I'll, I'll stop quoting the numbers. Um, I think I would say that a lot of that energy effect is kind of locked in, uh, again, based on our modelling of the futures curve, uh, and we're incredibly vigilant about making sure that the rest of it comes through. Does, does that help? Yeah, no, absolutely. So, Silvana, what, what do you see as the main risk <laughs> to uh, inflation coming down to 4% next year? Well, I mean, as Apart the Governor energy, and Jonathan I mean, yeah. said, um, un unless there is another big development that we don't know about and we have a you know, massive energy shock or something yeah. that is not on the cards, yeah. then I think the fall in inflation is pretty much guaranteed. And this is, again, that mechanical effect that we were mm. talking about. Mm. Those prices um, that, you know, went up incredibly uh, high uh, last year are coming down or stabilizing. And that turns that 8 percentage point contribution to zero or negative, and then you can do the arithmetic of the rest. Uh, there aren't other things that you're particularly worried about. I mean, it's the, I mean, it's the energy, I mean, given, unknown energy given price Given the shock, amount which, of tightening yeah. that we put in place... Which nothing can knock it off course, basically. Pardon me? Uh, the, nothing else can really knock it off course, then, apart from a big external shock. Not something that we mm. know at the moment, yeah. and that we possibly can know at the moment. Yeah. You, you know, you're... Um, in the, in the latest meeting, you wanted uh, interest rates to remain at 3.5%. Uh, do you, do you think that uh, the rates are at the wrong level now then, or have you changed your view? <coughs> well, I mean, as, as for all of us, my decision is, uh, is about how best we can meet the 2% target in the medium term, and in line with our remit. And, and of course, the reason why our remit focuses on the medium term and why we build forecasts is because there are lags in the transmission of monetary policy to the economy. It takes time for changes in bank rate to feed through. So uh, previous rate rises haven't fed through yet? And that's, uh, you, we've you seen very little of that uh, feeding yeah. through. About one-fifth of that has come through. The rest is still to come. And so the impact of monetary policy combined with this energy and other commodity prices and wine should be more than enough to get us actually not a target but below target in the medium term. And this is why, in my view, yes, um, uh, 
rates are too high right now, and um, that's that's why I didn't support this the vote. Yeah. Andrew, same question. I mean, apart from a big another new energy price shock that we, we mm. don't know, mm. about, what, what do you see as the other risks to inflation getting down to four percent next year? And, and is there any well, risk? That, uh, can be, I mean, just have to be clear because our, our, our target is two percent. Yeah, um, yeah, no, not um, your target, but the, the predicted four yeah. percent. Yeah. Um, so, Sylvana and, and Jonathan were saying, I think the base effects are, you know, unless, as I say, something happens that we just don't know about, I mean, that would be something like some development in Ukraine that we just don't know about at the moment, which would obviously be tragic. Um, those base effects are, are, you know, are, are sort of solidly built in because they're sort of arithmetic uh, in many ways. I think, for me, and this, this was the big decision we had this time, um, you know, you can reasonably, of course, as Sylvana has described, ask the question, if you've got that forecast, why are you raising interest rates at this point? And we, we spend a lot of time discussing this very question. For me, there is still you know, substantial remaining uncertainty, particularly about the domestic, the domestic side of things, um, because we have had this other shock, which is the tightening of the domestic labour market and particularly the rise in inactivity. Um, now, just to give a quick summary of what we're, what we're hearing and seeing at the moment on that front uh, is, that, is that, of course, at the moment, the, you know, the numbers remain tight, and they're tighter than we thought they would be at this point in time, and particularly on the inactivity side. The agents are telling us at the moment that there are early signs, and, and certainly I pick this up when I see firms as well, of some signs of loosening. But that will, that will come through more in a decline in vacancies and in, in a potentially in a decline in hours worked. It will not necessarily come through so much in a rise in unemployment. And the reason for that, and firms say this to me quite consistently, is that it is so hard to recruit people in the current environment and has been that they will be reluctant to shed people. And they're more, they're, they're more thinking in terms of reducing hours rather than heads. That's, by the way, important for our forecast because our, reducing hours has a different effect on people than, it, than losing jobs. It's a, it's a milder effect, and that does feed through into people's views on savings and on demand. The final thing I'd say on that is the, I mean, the survey evidence, I think Hugh was referring to this earlier, and, and one, came, one of the more prominent ones came out was it yesterday or the day before, the so-called REC survey. Does, and that's a leading indicator, so there's a lag before those sorts of surveys actually you know, come to pass, as it were. That is pointing to, and has been pointing for some months now, to a loosening uh, in the labour market and to a loosening in pay. For my part, though, uh, you know, why did I vote to raise rates? We need to see more evidence uh, that this has happened. We have not yet seen evidence of this, and uh, you know, I am very cautious on that front. Well, I, you know, as I said, I do think we've turned a corner in terms of headline inflation. You know, it, it is not only fallen, it's now under what we thought it would be in November, in the November report. But we need to see more evidence that this, uh, this process will, will take effect. You mentioned there the risk of a tight labour market. Um, yeah. what, what are the risks that uh, inflationary pay rises in one sector, and I'm thinking particularly the public sector, because we're obviously in the middle of the toughest public sector pay round for a generation at least. What are the risks that uh, if you had inflationary pay rises in the public sector, that would help fuel uh, wider inflation? Well, of course, I mean, uh, most of what we've talked about on the labour market is about the private sector, not the public sector, I should say, and that's, that, that's, that's where the, you know, the, the pay evidence is, is coming from. There's quite a big wedge now between private sector pay settlements and public sector pay settlements. I think uh, in terms of the debate on uh, public sector pay and its impact on the economy, I, will do, I mean, I'm, I will be careful what I say here, and I will just say one thing, and only one thing. I, it, you know, in terms of you think through to the demand effects, it does depend on how, how it's funded. Um, in you terms mean whether of, the government borrows more? Or, yes, yeah. uh, in terms of what its overall effect is. Because um, there is, I know, quite a debate about yeah, what's the impact of public sector pay on... On, the, on a, the overall de, overall demand in the economy, is it like private sector pay or is it not? Um, what's your, I, it, what's your, what's well, your I, view I, on I, that? So I'll be careful what I say yeah. here. I, I don't think you can say there's no effect. I really don't think you can say that. But I think it does depend. So what, what is the effect? Well, it does depend on how it's funded, frankly. I mean, if the government ends up having to borrow more... Uh, look, I'm really careful here because I'm not advocating anything at this point because this is not territory the Bank of England would, of course, want to be in. In economics of it, I think it depends whether you raise taxes or whether you borrow, frankly. Yeah. And it, but in, in terms of the, 
the actual public sector pay rise, are there, concern, are there concerns that, if it is inflation across the board in the public sector, are there concerns that it will raise uh, expectations of inflation across the board and sort of second order effects, or is it just that funding issue? Well, it's, uh, I think it very much depends what form it would take. I mean, let's also remember that at the moment all of these, I mean, when you talk about inflationary, all of these pay supplement scores are under the level of inflation. Um, but I think you do have to, you do obviously have to be forward, we have to be forward looking. We don't want to say, so you have to be forward looking here. I mean, what I would urge is that, you know, when, you know, when, when, when particularly going forwards, because we think inflation is going to fall very rapidly, that that is taken into, into account. I mean, you're right that obviously a lot of the, the pay offers at the moment are below inflation, but a lot of the pay demands are at inflation or above inflation. Uh, mm. And if they, but if they are met, those pay demands, then, uh, is it just purely how it's funded? That it'll, I mean, what could be the impact on inflation? Well, I mean, the, the, the point I've made, made before, and I you know, will make again on this point, is that if, because of the nature of the shocks that we've been having, and because they are predominantly external shocks, as colleagues have said, and this is coming through the terms of trade, if, I'm afraid, if, and I'll, I'll make it very clear, this applies to price setting as well as wage setting. It's so important to say that. If, if of course, there's a continual attempt to beat those shocks, then I'm afraid that's, the, the chair's absolutely right, that's where the second round effects mm -hmm. come from. Now, let's go, I mean, we, we've seen, you know, pay settlements, in particular in the private sector, are higher than, than consistent with the target. Mm -hmm. um, they're not at the level of inflation. Uh, and the question for us, as I said before, is, you know, are, are we now beginning to see evidence of loosening in the labour market which will affect those pay settlements? And, and there, is some, there is evidence to suggest that, but it's, in my view, too soon to conclude. Well, the, the last question on this before I move on, but if, if, the, if the, the government did meet the in, in inflation wage claims for in, across the public sector uh, and borrowed for it, because taxes are already at 70 year high. What you said there would be an impact. What, what, what would be the well, scale? There would be a fiscal impact in that case, and that would then have to feed through but into. What, yeah, what would be the impact on inflation? Well, it would, it, it would effectively cause a stimulation for the fiscal effects, uh, and we would have to take that into account. So, yes, it would have an effect if you do that. In terms of potentially higher interest rates than would otherwise be the case. But I, I want to be very clear, I, you know, because this is obviously a sensitive subject. I want to do no more than lay out the channels. That it's asking about the economics. No, I know you are. I know you are. That's, that's <laughs> fair, it's a fair it's, question. I mean, it's one of the things no, the, no, government, perfect, the government has to think no, about. No, it's a totally fair uh, question, but, I'm, but uh, yeah, this is a very sensitive subject, so I will merely lay out the channels. I'm not going to advocate you know, any particular policy here or there. Yeah. No, no, I get that. It's, it, but yeah. it's, obviously that's one of the factors the government has to think about when it's uh, you know, in the middle of these negotiations. Yeah. Can I ask about, um, so actually I'm going to come to Hugh, sorry you haven't had a chance to, yeah, no, and I've got some, some other, other questions. So Hugh, the, the, my, my sort of initial question of what, what do you see as the main risks of, yeah, yeah. You, you've got this forecast of going down to 4% by the end of the year, uh, and apart from a, some new developments in the energy markets in Ukraine, uh, what do you see as the main risk to that? And do, you, and do you think the government is pretty much guaranteed to meet its own target of halving inflation by the end of the year? Well, I mean, I'm on the end, so I, I, a lot has been said, yeah, so I'll try, I, I'll try not to totally echo. Um, I mean, I think it is, in, so I'll try and pick out my key points. So I, I just wanted to echo something the chair said right at the beginning, um, and a little bit Andrew picked up, <laughs> and Andrew picked up on. I mean, I think it is important to see inflation is too high, and that has consequences for households and so forth, which uh, is exactly why we are committed to get inflation back to target. Um, and having inflation go to 5% or stop rising, etc., is not the same as getting it back to target. Our yeah, target is yeah. 2%, yeah. and we need to get back not just inflation to there at one moment in time, but on a sustainable basis through time. Mm -hmm. And that's the focus of our ambition and our actions and hopefully um, what we achieve. In terms of the forecast, and as, as has been said by others, inflation is forecast to fall and is forecast to fall quite rapidly. The reason it's forecast to fall is the mirrored image of why it rose last year. So we had the big rises in energy prices driven by external developments, which entered into CPI inflation. And those big rises will now fall out of the annual calculation. Yeah. In some cases, they will be placed by still rises, just smaller rises. But nonetheless, that will result in a fall in annual inflation. Yeah. And that's what we're looking at. Um, what are the threats to that? Well, I think it is important to recognize that if we get big shocks, 
and those big shocks might be energy price shocks, but potentially they could be other shocks too, um, that could have an impact on inflation. But the character of shocks is that they are uncertain. And this is, you know, just to go back, hark back briefly to what we discussed, when I joined the bank kind of halfway through the process that we were discussing in response to the previous set of questions, I mean, when I joined the bank, I had a briefing on where we stand. I had a briefing on geopolitical developments. And the Russia-Ukraine situation was mentioned, but it wasn't in the top five. Right? So it really was a shock what happened. Mm. I think Silvana emphasized that addressing that shock would have required big um, developments in the UK economy. I think it's also important to keep in mind that um, given the lags in transmission in order to have that impact, you would have to have known before the shock happened to avoid the volatility in price developments. And because it was a genuine shock, in the sense we didn't have the one year to 18 months pre-warning, monetary policy was not really in a position to prevent the volatility we've seen. And that's why inflation went up a lot. But it's also why inflation will come down a lot owing to these base effects. Um, you know, very high level... I think in order to address, address inflationary dynamics in the economy, um, and I, I would agree that because of other developments, including those in the labor market we've just been discussing, we have some domestic dynamic in inflation. We have done quite a lot to address that. Um, we've raised bank rate by almost 400 basis points. We've gone from a situation where we were doing QE to now we're doing QT. The communication around monetary policy has changed very much since I joined the bank in September 2021. So all of those things have had their influence on market rates, uh, including market rates at the sort of two to three year horizon that have a big impact on mortgage rates. And that is a big channel of transmission uh, of monetary policy into the economy. And that's something I think is we'll return to, I'd imagine, this morning. Mm. Uh, and I very much agree with what Silvana said about this policy in the pipeline because of what we have done and because of the lags that I've emphasized, there is still more effect of this policy to come through into the UK economy. And I think it is important to see that those transmission lags are famously non long and variable. Mm. And crucially, I think, they are also not entirely predictable. And so I would caution against the idea we can fine tune developments in the UK economy. So, you know, when we talk about inflation going to 4%, we have the famous sort of rivers of blood chart yeah, yeah. of inflation, mm -hmm. and that reveals the uncertainties. Some of that uncertainty is associated with the possibility of further shocks, but mm -hmm. some is uncertainties about how what we do transmits into the economy. And there is an irreducibility of how that works, mm -hmm. an irreducible uncertainty there, mm -hmm. I think. And just again, to hark back briefly, is I think that does also caution about too much focus on is it September, November, December, because the reality is we don't have that close control of the economy. So to me, the sort of message of the autumn of 2021 was when I joined the bank, and this was not because I joined the bank, there was an inflection point in the conduction mm -hmm. of monetary policy. Mm -hmm. And we went from a mode of being supportive in the face of the pandemic mm -hmm. to being a mode of tightening in face of inflationary mm -hmm. pressures. And I think that that's the big story, and the big story was right. And I think that will contain inflation on this sustainable basis over the medium term, and that's the important thing. I think trying to expect perfection on a month-to-month -month basis is yeah, just to expect too much of monetary policy makers. Yeah. And I understand from where you sit, whoops, I understand from where you sit that you should hold us to a high degree. We are accountable to you, and looking to perfection from us is not an unreasonable thing for you. I can only speak for myself, but I think I can speak to some extent for others. Of course, we strive for perfection, but we will fall short. Mm. But at the same time, I think it's about getting the big questions right. And I feel very confident in line with things that Jonathan has said, that we did get the big questions right at the end of 2021 and into 2022 by tightening monetary policy and then in the face of the energy price shock, acceleration, accelerating the, the, the degree of tightening. So having said all that, I mean, to me, the challenge now is we have done a lot. There's still more to come through from what we have done. We have to be prepared to see it through. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of impact on the economy, we will have challenges. We'll have political challenges. We'll have economic challenges. But seeing it through is the key uh, element of where we are. 
It's crucial to see it through that we do enough to address potential upside risks to inflation. So I would agree with various things that have been said, but if you ask me what is the danger to the 4% or the danger to going to 2%, it is seeing greater persistence inflationary dynamics associated with stronger pricing power on the corporate side in the UK economy, so supply chain disruptions and so forth and so on, and or um, stronger uh, wage and cost of elements in the labour market owing to the unexpected and continued tightness of the labour market, which we've done a lot of work on, we think in line with what Andrew has said is beginning to change, but nonetheless there are deep structural issues what's going on in the labour market that are not fully understood and we need to understand better. So I think that is where the issue is. I think we need to guard against doing too much with policy because there is a danger of oversteering if there are lags in transmission. Um, but at least where I stand now, the sort of right stance, which is, I think, more similar with what Andrew and Jonathan have said, is that I think we should be watchful to these risks of greater persistence. That port points to me to looking at developments in price-setting behavior in the corporate sector and wage and cost-setting behavior and tightness in the labor market and how that feeds through into services, price inflation, and so forth. I think we've been pretty clear in our communications. That's where our focus is. Um, and should we see things there that cause us to worry? And in particular, I think what you can miss in these discussions is, very understandably, we tend to address these questions like shock by shock. What's the impact of the labor market tightness? What's the impact of higher energy prices? What's the impact of the supply chain disruptions? I think what we have to do, and where the forecast helps us in our discussions, is take notice of how these things interact with each other. So it's the combination back at the turn of 2021 of that period of supply chain disruption with unexpected tightness in the labor market that I think led to greater persistence than we would have liked to see. Yeah. And again, it's in the, the course of last year, it's the combination of that tightness in the labor market with the impact of the energy price shock. Yeah. And looking forward, I think if you ask me to say, what's the biggest risk? The biggest risk, I think, would be that it's that interaction with a continued unexpected tightness in the UK labor market with some external inflationary shock rather than one or the other in isolation that I would be most concerned with. Can I just ask you the question that I asked uh, Andrew? Sorry about that. You talked about wage setting there. How, how, as chief economist of the Bank of England, what, if, if the government uh, did give inf pay rises across the public sector that were close to inflation, yeah. or, or that, what would be the impact on future uh, inflation and interest rates? I think you're asking me to give a different, question, different answer to the government. <laughs> no, 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 I'm just, I'm just teasing by that. I'm sure you'll agree with him. You might say you might expound a bit more. I think, I think to, to give the answer I want to give to that, I'm going to have to give you a slightly broader context, so you're going to have to be patient with me, right? So I promise not to run time down through this way. So, again, if we look at what happened last year, what is the big shock to the UK economy? Well, as others have said, the big shock, it was unexpected, as I've said, is the rising gas prices. And that wasn't just unexpected, it was a massive shock. You know, when I joined the bank, the gas price was 75 pence per therm. If you look in table 1B, mm. the average pre-COVID is running at about 50 pence per therm. Mm. At its peak on uh, August bank holiday last year, it's 880 mm. pence per therm. Mm. So it went up more than 11 times. Yeah. You're much more my than question. A, <laughs> sorry? Are you going to answer my question? No, no, I am. I am. But I, this is very important to, to set the context. Right? So there is this unexpected massive shock. And because the UK is a net importer of natural gas, and we are quite, reliant, right? yeah. so we are quite reliant on natural gas for heating and electricity yeah. generation, this represents a very significant adverse terms of trade shock. So, you know, I've said this in this room before, but simply put, the price of what we're buying from the rest of the world has gone up a lot relative to the price of what we're selling to the rest of the world. So for UK residents, that implies a big squeeze on income. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So the question at hand is, who, who's real spending power? And it, it, it's income in real terms, real spending power. So who is going to take that cost? How is that distributed across public sector workers, across private sector workers, via government trans transfers to future taxpayers rather than current taxpayers, or to people who rely on profits for their income rather than people who rely on wages for their income? So I don't think it's for the Bank of England 
to have a judgment about these distributional questions. We don't have a mandate for oh, that. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't asking that. No, 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 no. <laughs> but, but the point I want to make, so that was all preamble to get to the punchline, which is the answer to your question. So I apologize. I did warn you it was going to take a while, but now we get to the punchline to your question. The punchline to the question is, is the way I see it is the more intense that distributional battle, right? So there is a certain size of a pie. It's a smaller pie than people have liked. Everybody tries to retain their real spending sh- pa- mm. sh- power by asking for a bigger share of mm. a smaller pie. It's the irreconcilability of everybody asking for that mm. bigger share that is what drives the inflation. The country. Right. Yeah. And so the implication of what you're saying is if, you know, whether it's um, wage bargaining behavior or price setting behavior or the uh, actions of public sector workers versus private sector workers, these are all parts of the intensity of that. What well, all we can do and what we should do and will do is ensure that we respond with monetary policy to make sure that the intensity of that distributional question does not spill over into inflation. And so if your point is, if things we see or lead to greater intensity in that distribution battle, as Andrew said, that implies that monetary policy will be tighter in order to keep aggregate behavior in the economy in line with price stability. Just to be explicit in that, if the my, my precise question was on, on if the public sector wage uh, agreements are of inflation or around inflation, it, that will what you're saying. I'm just trying to unpack what you're saying. Mm-hmm. Is that would have some impact on future inflation? Oh, it's and potential. Rates. So I mean, the, there is certainly the potential for that to happen, and if that happens. Our job is to ensure it does not lead to inflation by responding to it with tighter monetary policy. Okay, thank you. I've got questions about the um, bonus cap and everything. Should yeah, I do that we'll now we'll or later? Yeah, we'll come back after yeah. to do that. Yeah. We'll just stick with the monetary yeah. policy yeah. thread for now. And, and I just uh, wondered, uh, Hugh, if you could uh, quantify for us that because you f- were forecasting 13.1% uh, inflation peak at one point, and uh, the peak, I think, was 107 um, is that difference uh, the energy price cap on households and businesses, or, or is it something else? Um, I mean, it largely is. So if, if you look back, I think you're referring to the August mm. uh, r- uh, report. Mm. So in the August report, if you remember at that mm. time, uh, partly because of the political situation in the UK, mm. uh, we did not have a fiscal response mm. to the very dramatic rise mm. in European so wholesale gas rates. Um, yeah. And at the time we made the report, which was based on, um, you know, we make an assumption uh, about how, mm. uh, what wholesale gas mm. prices would be based on market pricing. Yeah. So the, the window we were looking at for the August report yeah. was basically a mm. uh, two week period towards the end of July. Um, uh, in that period, uh, that would lead, and it's a, it was at that point quite a mechanical calculation. Yeah. Yeah because it's about futures prices feeding yeah. into the off-gen price cap and so forth. Yeah. And that, that off-gen price cap, how it applies to the average uh, household, how much energy they spend in their utility bill, that is what enters the CPI inflation calculation. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a fairly mechanical dynamic that led to that. I mean, unfortunately, and this is what we discussed in this room in September, was it's mechanical and obvious to everybody. Mm. So during August, wholesale gas prices doubled again. Mm. Um, and lots of investment banks made the same calculation. And if you remember, there was this mm. discussion of, is their forecast for inflation, mm. which were actually substantially higher than 13%, mm. were they legitimate or not? But through this, through this mechanism, they were entitled. But of course, once we had uh, the new prime minister, we had the energy price guarantee and so forth. And that shifted from what could have been uh, on the off-gem measure of average household energy bill, uh, you know, potentially approaching £6,000 a year, yeah. down to about, well, £2,500 a year. You think the difference between the 13.1 and the 10.7 is by and large explained by the energy price cap? Yeah, I think a big yeah. part of okay. it is. All right, Danny. Thank you, Chair. Great. Um, we've got a bunch of questions, so um, appreciate um, fairly snappy answers. I mean, uh, at your discretion, but don't need too much context. Um, and in fact, this one, I'd really appreciate a, some clarity, Governor, if I may start with you with a really st- straightforward question. You've said it, what, you're, you're, the report is now saying that we th- think that inflation, we've turned the corner on inflation. That's the headline message, I think, from the yeah. report. But at the same time, you're raising rates. Yes. And you're doing so before the full effect of the last rate rises yes. has been properly felt. So can you just explain for... Mm. 
the public what the message you're hoping they should take about your assessment of inflation at yeah. this time. I'm happy to do that because this was, a, as I said earlier, this is a very big subject of conversation in the round we've just had. So I do believe that inflation has yeah, just, just turned a corner, and the reason for that is that the last two months we've seen a lower number, but it is also, as I said a few moments ago, below where we thought it would be. Yeah, it's a bit below where we thought it would be in the November report. Second, and probably yeah, much more significant, is, as we've said, this, you know, very, these very strong negative base effects that we, you know, will other, other things equal bring it down quite substantially. More so in the second half of the year than the first half of the year, by the way, in terms of the slope, that is, mm. but, but they will bring it down. However, um, as we've discussed quite a bit already this morning, there is substantial uncertainty, uh, not, not around the base effects. I mean, we've since covered that off, I think, by saying it would take something we don't know about to, in a sense, counteract those. But just where the labor market is going and just where price setting is going in, in the economy. Now, the agents, as I said, are telling us they, you know, they do see signs now that it is turning. But my view is that we are at a point where the uncertainty is such that, and the risks are therefore such. And but bear in mind in the chart that he was referring to, the so-called fan chart, we have got the largest upside risk on inflation uh, that we've ever had in the life of the MPC, which is over 25 years now. And, and the reason for that is that uh, you know, there are a number of stories you can tell that you know, create that risk. Uh, one is, is obviously labor market pressures. Two would be if, uh, if energy prices do not keep coming down as the futures curve of markets suggests that they will. And we did actually put a number in there that, uh, because we used to use a different approach, which was to take the first six months of the futures curve and then just pin it basically at a constant mm -hmm. level. If you impose that onto the forecast we've got now, you add about 0.8 of a percent onto inflation. So you can see there's upside risks. But particularly with the labor market, and speaking for myself in terms of my own, my own vote in, in, in this last round, I, I, I want to see more evidence that we really, we've turned a corner, but that we really are going to go, go on now. And particularly, it's not just what happens this year. In fact, it's not primarily. It, it's that we do sustain it thereafter. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So to summarize for, uh, for me, uh, the, okay. your assumption is that, uh, that inflation is now falling, but in order to make sure, you need to keep the lid on demand a little longer. Uh, yes. And, well, yes, and that we need to see where the labor market and price setting is going to. Okay. Thank you. Um, it's very difficult communication. I do appreciate it. You're, you're, you're trying to basically put the foot on the acceleration and the brake almost at the same time. You want to encourage confidence, but also not uh, have yeah. too much exuberance in the system. Um, so it's difficult communication. It reminds me slightly of the Archbishop of Canterbury trying to have it both ways. Uh, well, he's it, got a divine intervention on his well, side. Well, you two, too. So do you. So do you. <laughs> so do you. Um, uh, so can I, uh, given, the, given the challenge of the communication, I'm going to slightly sort of attack you all from both sides, if I may. Um, Go on. Uh, on... On, on the inflation prediction, so we've discussed this a bit already, but the predictions for services inflation still is in fact higher than you were thinking it was going to be last mm. time round. So, and that is largely driven by wages. And I know you've discussed this with Anthony, but just you, you famously said, Governor, some time ago that you discouraged people from seeking pay, pay rises. No, do you feel vindicated by that I, I, warning? I, I, and do you I want to repeat clear. it? I mean, that was in the context of, of excessive pay rises that seek to beat inflation. And it's Hugh's point about the cake or the pie, as he said. Mm. We, we know why it would be natural to do that, but as um, I think Anthony interjected a few minutes ago, the, unfortunately, the nature of these shocks, these terms of trade shocks, is that the, the country is worse off as a whole. Mm. And, and it's that process. But no, I'm not, I, I don't want to sound, uh, no, I'm not going to say I'm vindicated. Um, you know, it, it is a very difficult situation for people in this country. Mm and for particularly for those on low incomes. Yeah. Well, let me, let me come up from the, from, the, from the other side, perhaps, then, and sit, talk about people uh, who are working hard on low incomes, which are people in the construction sector. So yeah. this is a leading indicator, as I understand it. Often you can see what's happening in the economy a little further ahead if you look at what's going on in mm. construction. Uh, jobs in that sector are, 
are falling. I mean, there's increasing vacancies in construction. Mortgage demand is very low. We're putting up rates again. How much uh, rate rises, how much interest rate increases do you think the housing market can bear? At what point are you, would you start to worry about the effect on, on the housing market from these rate rises? Well, we do follow it very, very carefully. What I would say is that, in, particularly in terms of uh, new fixed rate mortgages, which is, is of course, fixed rates are now the predominant uh, mortgage type in this country, rates have gone up clearly, as I think we were saying earlier, and Silvana was saying it earlier, because obviously we've put rates up. Actually, over the last, since November, and I think since we had the hearing in November, when I did say I, would hope, I hoped that mortgage rates would come down, they have. So, you know, you know, not, un, not, not untypical, about 1% actually have come down. And the reason for that, of course, is that, is that these fixed rate mortgages are priced off the, off the interest rate curve, they're priced off the swap curve, actually. And we have seen since the sort of the, obviously, period of, period of, uh, of difficulty in September and October, the curve as a whole has come down, and that's been reflected through into, into mortgage pricing. So that is helpful, I think. Yes, well, demand is coming down too. Well, I think yes, but can we? Those are some. Those are slightly backward-looking indicators. I think again, you know, the, the effects of last autumn affected also activity in the housing market because as you may remember a lot of mortgage products got withdrawn from the market. They're coming back onto the market yes. now, so we'll see. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, um, Hugh. Can I ask you about the uh, the, the future and the sort of scenario we might find ourselves in. I appreciate there's we're not totally clear whether we're going to be in recession or not, very much hope not, but, but some significant risk of it. If we were, I mean, uh, uh, recessions usually involve you know, very low inflation. We're, even if we hit the targets that we're hoping for here, we're still going to be at 5% inflation and potentially in a recession. The combination of that is terrible and it does take us back to the 1970s. Yeah, if wages are falling as well, but prices are rising, that is absolutely catastrophic for living standards. How much do you worry about? Well, I'm sure you worry a lot, but to what extent do you foresee a sort of stagflationary or inflationary recession? So, of course, we're very concerned about that. Mm. I, I hesitate because I know you've asked for short answers, but I just want to put in context. I mean, what we can do with monetary policy okay. is essentially steer spending in the economy, demand in the economy, including through the channel you mentioned, through the housing market, but also other channels. And we want to steer demand and spending in the economy such that we don't generate too much demand relative to the productive potential of the economy to generate either more inflation or more, more persistence in inflation. But equally, you know, there are risks on the other side. If we slow spending down too much by over-raising interest rates and so forth, then too weak demand relative to the production potential of the economy will obviously lead to downward pressures and prices and ultimately um, uh, disinflationary forces that push us below target. So to meet the inflation target sustainably, what we're trying to do is, is sort of map, given the inflation rate, our uh, steering of demand, given the production potential of the economy. So I do think it's important to see, and of course this edition of the Monetary Policy Report contains a big section looking at the supply side of the UK economy, it is important to see that the supply side of the UK economy in our forecast is weak, and that is a constraint on our ability to let demand run. Now, to a first approximation, I think to say this is black and white, I think we'll take it too far, but to a first approximation, monetary policy does not have that much effect on the supply side of the economy. And we can talk, and maybe you want to talk, about why we take the view that the supply side of the economy remains very weak. And I think that's important to put this notion of you know, recession and so forth in context. So we have a very shallow recession by the historical standards of recessions. It's still a recession in our forecast, meaning on the definition that's typically used, a technical recession of at least two quarters of negative growth. But we are kind of bobbling around zero, right? So in fact, the fourth quarter, which we thought would be a negative number, may turn out to be a zero or positive number. And then the second half of last year may not be a technical recession. Once we're bobbling around the zero sort of level, for exactly the reasons we talked about earlier, uh, in, given the uncertainties we face, including the uncertainties about how our policy transmits, um, we may see weak positive growth, we may see recessions, we may see negative growth. So yeah. the point is, I, I, would, I would a little bit get away from focusing on recessions. But I think we will see a relatively long period of weak growth. 
And the fundamental driver of that is weakness on the supply side. Well, I w- I do, we do want to come on to the supply side in a bit, if you don't mind. But, I mean, that might be true that the recession will be weaker over, overall and seeing from the, from the bird's eye perspective. But actually, for particular sectors of the population, it's going to be very acute. Perhaps, perhaps in fact, that's a difference between recessions historically, that it'll be far worse for some people that it wouldn't have formally. And I think you know, I mentioned particular people in working in construction. But, you know, if we're talking about wage deflation in, you know, in, in some areas and these price rises, it's going to be absolutely catastrophic for a good... I mean, I think the, is it the NIS, SCR... Uh, saying this week they're expecting a quarter of households to be unable to cover food and energy. So I certainly don't want to push back against the cost of this environment. It goes very much to what our chair said in her opening, I think, first sentence almost is, I mean, inflation has been too high. It may have been driven by external sources, and we're trying to correct it. Yeah. Um, but this terms of trade shock has very big implications and very challenging implications yeah. for a set of businesses in some sectors rather than others, in yeah. some parts of the country rather than others, and sets of households, particularly those towards the bottom end of the income distribution who spend more on energy and food. So we are very aware of that. I think it's also important, though, to, to recognize that monetary policy, as sort of we've been discussing, is potentially a very powerful tool to steer aggregate behavior in the economy, Mm -hmm. but it's also a very blunt tool, and it's just not well designed to try and have impacts on one sector or the other. And we don't have a mandate to do that as the MPC. Of course we need to monitor that, because how our policy transmits into the aggregate is importantly affected by these distributional effects. So we do look at cross-sectional, cross-regional, cross-income distribution impact of our policies very closely, and that's something we monitor. Okay. Um, but I think we have to be cautious about taking responsibility for something that, frankly, we don't have the instruments to address. I appreciate you. Are, you're, you're, you're very powerful but very blunt levers at your disposal. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Hugh. Professor Tenreo, can I, can I come to you? Uh, you're the leading dove on the committee, so I understand it, on, on interest rates. Um, would you, I mean, is it possible to ask you to tell us now what your advice will be in three months' time, but at the moment, do you expect to be calling for a cut in rates, seeing as you didn't support the raise that we've just seen when it comes to the next meeting? And I suppose a fairer way of asking that is what will you be looking for, for the advice that... If, if, if we were to expect you, if we were to see you calling for a cut, what would you be looking for in advance of that, and how would you con- what would you expect your colleagues to be convinced by that would make them support you in a in a rate cut? Well, I, I think I made my points clear that I think mm. uh, policy is already uh, too tight to meet the target. Yeah. Uh, in our forecast, we have uh, our model projections for inflation fall well below the target. Um, the mean uh, projection, mean inflation, also falls below the target. So that means that uh, the risk to the downside of that 2% is higher in, in, in those projections than, than the risk to the upside. Um, as I, you know, again, as, as I said in, uh, in, um, before, um, how can we loosen policy? One is directly through cutting rates or through an inversion in, in the curve. And yeah. uh, that can happen on, on its own, even without our actions. Um, but uh, definitely, I, 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 you know, where things stand right now, I would see myself um, considering a, a cut. I don't want to talk about a particular meeting because meeting to meeting doesn't make much of a difference. But the overall stance of policy right now is, uh, is um, I lose in my view. There are, of course, as the governor said, upside risks. Energy prices can go up. But also, as we saw, they can go down. Um, they're still much higher than they were pre-COVID. Um, so there's always that possibility to do. In this round, we made a judgment uh, to push uh, up demand and hence inflation. And uh, there are also risks to that um, on the downside. Um, so yeah, I have a more balanced view of the risks at, at, at this stage, certainly around hitting the 2% target in the medium yes. term. Okay. Well, thank you. I mean, I'm going to come on in a moment to, to energy costs, if that's okay. But, um, Professor Haskell, can I, can I put the Professor Tenreo's point to you? If inflation falls uh, very fast, you'll end up below target, and then you'll have, be having to 
uh, to, to unwind these, these right, rate rises very fast. What, what danger do you foresee if that were to happen? Do you, are you worried about having to, raise, uh, to cut rates very fast and what, what the effect of that might be? Yeah, thanks. Um, can I just step back for a moment, if you yeah. forgive me? I know you wanted crisp well, no, answers. That's right. Well. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you'll forgive me. I mean, we've talked a lot um, about uncertainty. And so you might say, well, what do we do in the face of uncertainty? Do we just sort of throw up our hands and just say it's all too difficult? And in my opinion, we should not do that. We should do two things, at least. One is we should guard very um, uh, uh, vigilantly against really bad outcomes. And one really bad outcome would be a lot of inflationary momentum mm. in the economy, as we've just discussed. Mm. The other bad outcome, to your question, would be if we undershot the, t the, the target very severely. So that, that's kind of rule number one. Rule number two, which I think follows from that, is because of these risks and these uncertainties, we should be super vigilant on the signals that we are getting so, uh, as they come along. So we can learn something about the risks Mm. Um, and, and, and therefore better inform our judgment. And, and the reason I, forgive me, if I, I sort of say all of that is what then am I doing? I'm very worried about um, excessive momentum uh, building up for inflation and therefore I want to guard against that, number one. And number two is I am putting a bit less weight than I would otherwise do on the medium-term forecast and I'm looking much more at the shorter-term indicators, to which you might say, well, what short-term indicators? Uh, and I, I've, in speeches, I've tried to go through a number, number of those. The ratio of vacancies to unemployment, for example, is, a, is I think, an important, somewhat leading indicator, because putting out a vacancy means a firm mm. is indicating in the, their future expectations mm. of high demand, so I'll be looking at that. Mm. Um, the redundancy numbers, uh, again, because many companies have to notify the government if they intend to make redundancy under certain circumstances, big amounts of redundancies, those are, I think, a kind of an interesting, almost accidental kind of leading indicator. Mm. And those are very low at the moment. The VE ratio um, is very high. Um, and more broadly, the indices of inactivity, which the governor has sort of talked about before. Mm. So all, all that is to say, um, I am super worried about um, uh, going under the target. But as I say, given the uncertainties at the moment, I'd rather put weight, I'd rather put a little bit less weight uh, on that medium-term forecast uh, mm. and look for those um, shorter-run mm. indicators. I, yeah. I, I hope that's helpful. Yeah. Can I very briefly make one other point? We will, of course, if, if we get this outcome of, of, of inflation falling rapidly, we do have to stabilise inflation at the target. Mm. I just want to emphasise that point yeah. because we could see it go under target just as we've seen it go over target because base effects, by definition, don't recur in the mm. same way. Mm. Yes. So that, that will have to be, of course, a, a critical focus for us. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Shall I move on to energy Go costs now? It, Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. Next topic. All very related. Um, uh, so, I mean, when you came for us, I think it was in November, uh, Governor, I asked you the impossible question about how you could have such confidence that inflation was going to fall when it was all in Mr. Putin's hands. It remains in Putin's hands, you know, to, to a significant degree. And I think you said in the media last week that as long as Russia continues this barbaric war, there's always the possibility that energy prices could go up again. Yes. Um, can you just tell us to, to precisely how you factored that risk into your work? I mean, to, it's, a, it's an impossible question to answer, but it doesn't appear that this war is going to end imminently. No. Uh, and there is always the chance of further d decisions or events choking off supply even further. How have you factored that into your... Well, um, this comes back, of course, to what a number of us have said in the course of this discussion, that, you know, of course, we can't deal with something that's totally unpredictable in that sense, and we've had yeah. to come to that. What we have done, I'll, I'll just make two points, actually. First thing, and I'll go back to something I said a few minutes ago, and is in the report, which is we have done the... Yeah, we, we've conditioned the forecast on what we call the full, the full futures curve, i.e. The full, the full duration of the futures curve. Now, that's a change of methodology, actually, from what, what we were doing in the past, but partly because, actually, if we, the, the old method, as I said, was we used the first six months of the futures curve, then we took, we took a constant price thereafter. The, the problem we ran into, was it last year, yeah, yeah, was that particularly with, when going back to the summer, we would have had a very strange pattern to energy price inflation if we'd done that, actually, because of the, not least because of the way the sports scheme worked, not a criticism of it. 
But as I said, we have done the what if. The staff did the what if. We actually had the other, not the full futures curve. Either. They don't keep coming down, but they, yeah, they, they, they stick in, in, in the way we used to do it. And as I said earlier, yeah, staff estimate that would add about, about 0.8% to inflation. Now, you know, that, that's, that's, that's part of our consideration in the upside risk. We don't build the upside risk up bottom up. We do it rather top down, but then we have stories that sit underneath it. And that's part of it. Okay. Um, can I just make one other point? I, I, I just wanted to make a point that came out of something Hugh was saying. It's relevant to the energy point. And it's relevant to this point about low-income households. It's important to know, because Hugh gave the price of 50p a firm as the sort of pretty stable price pre all the Ukrainian uh, things starting. This big downshift in, in energy prices and inflation does not take the level of household energy prices back to that level. Mm. Yeah. Okay. And of course, for the cost of living, that's very, you know, that's relevant. Yeah. Okay. So I just want to... Uh, Wait, no, no, no point, point, point taken. Uh, I, I want to come back to some of your points, but Professor, do you want to come in? Yeah, if, if forgive me, just to add a little bit to what mm. and Andrew said. I, being an economics professor, of course, I've got to talk about supply and demand. So you'll have seen in the report we look at the demand for energy and see whether that has changed uh, and, and would that affect the outlook. And in chart 2.14, there is somewhat of an indication that people's demand for energy might have gone down. That's one thing, if I may. The second thing, if I may, is as you'll know, what's crucial in the energy market is that, in the, um, is that we build up very high inventories of gas, which we then run down uh, uh, you know, uh, later you know, to come into the winter. So we monitor those inventories very closely as well to help us give a forward-looking picture about what prices might be. Understood. Thank no, you very much. Really, very much. Just to complement that, that they, I mean, there are um, at the storage levels that are up uh, at 80 percent or so in the middle of the winter. So this is a very high level to start. They're, they're right at generally, the, mm, yeah, they're at right the, at the top of the 2017 to 22 range, okay. indeed. Yeah. And more generally, I mean, there is a substitution to alternative uh, suppliers and sources of energy, which has also eased mm. the pressure um, and could be a source of downside risk as well. Going yes. Okay. Well, but we, we we applaud demand reduction in energy. So that is. Uh, I mean, to be. Uh, said, I mean, that has been huge in continental Europe. In yeah. this country, I think there is more to be done. More to be done. Um, Great. Well, I, let, let's, let's, we, should, we should think about policies on that. I think wearing three-piece suits is a very <laughs> helpful way to <laughs> reduce yeah, demand for energy, and I encourage it yeah. uh, for all members of the committee. Um, uh, so, so um, Governor, you talked about the, the futures uh, market, which is, in, in a sense, that seems to be the sort of the god of this of the, uh, uh, of this bit of, of policy making, we, when we had the OBR and we said to them, "How? What are you basing your predictions on?" It? Well, I think no. We asked the Chancellor, and he said, "The OBR says that inflation is coming down." We said to the OBR, "Why is inflation coming down?" He said, "Because the futures, energy futures market says it is. They're very, very bullish about reductions in energy costs. Why do you think that is? What? On what I mean, the war isn't ending anytime soon. How, is there more LNG? LNG going to kind of come out of the nowhere? What, why do you think the futures market is so confident?" Well, of course, energy prices, first of all, I mean, since we came, I think since we had the hearing in November, um, wholesale gas prices have come down a lot. I mean, it's 50%. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I have to, you yeah, know, again, yeah, we, we have to sort of, you know, be clear on the limits of our knowledge. That's not something we predicted when we were here in November. Yeah. I think looking forwards, I would say it's a, it, you know, there's, there's a balance of factors uh, in the market. And I think some of them point one way and some the other way, frankly. I think, you know, Europe has built up its capacity to receive particularly liquefied natural gas from yeah. other parts of the world. And that has helped, particularly with what Silvana and Jonathan were talking about, the storage position, that has helped a lot. I, I, think, I think my assessment would be I don't think currently there is a large increase in global investment in more gas extraction and oil extraction. Um, so that has uh, obviously will have an effect in terms of available supply. I mean, there's a very interesting question, obviously, about how the Chinese economy is going to recover and come out of the COVID restrictions and what that will do to the China's demand for, uh, for energy, because China's obviously a major, uh, uh, major importer. And, of course, the, the, the third factor is, um, is, is Russia. Uh, obviously, you know, parts of the world that are implementing sanctions have reduced their... Uh, Dependence on Russian supplies. Uh, the question is, you know, there are other parts of the world. Don't put it that way. Yes, um, first I want to come to you. But can I just ask you to, in, in your question to answer this as well, which is to uh, to say, I mean, it, 
if we are going to have persistently high energy costs, and they might not be as high as now, but still, I think it's fair to say we're going to have high energy prices for some time. Does that automatically mean persistently high interest rates, in your view? Um, let me answer the, the reason I wanted to come is was on the bullish point, if I may. Yeah. So just if I can say, in chart 2.3, we do indeed show what you might would imagine be a very bullish diagram, which is that futures energy prices, which I think you're referring yes. to, do dive right down. But they dive right down to a level, the axis of the chart starts in January 2022. And I think, as Hugh said earlier on, there was, of course, a big run-up in gas prices in advance to the war. Um, so although that chart looks like energy prices are going to drop back down to where they were, they're still well yes. above. Well, not made about levels. I'm sorry, yes, yeah. yes, yeah. indeed, yeah. Andrew, yeah. yes. Uh, they're, they're still very well above, you know, what they were um, yeah. in immediately before that. So I wouldn't, if I may... I wouldn't be too bullish on the basis of that chart, if you sort of see what I mean. Okay. We still okay. end up... OK, at, well, at indeed, at yes, yes. Overall, we keep being optimistic about a fall from a very high rate mm. on all these things, back down, down to a rate which is not still not comfortable. Um, and and, and do you think, sorry, yeah. Professor, well, the other professor, do you still do you, do you think that high those high prices are going to just lead automatically to high rates as a persistent feature? Um, no, not life? necessarily. Okay. Um, look, it depends how the economy adjusts. This is a high level of prices, which, as we've discussed, is very painful for people, and, and I don't want to minimise that. But as far as inflation is concerned, it's perfectly consistent to have a high level of prices, and it be consistent with falling inflation, with constant inflation. Um, so not necessarily, no. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. that's precisely the point I was um, mm. going to make. There is a distinction between the levels and if, you know the change and uh, and here we even if we remain with very high levels of uh, energy prices um, the contribution they make to inflation if they stay at those high elevated uh, high levels uh, is zero I mean as, as long as they don't keep increasing so okay. that's the, the distinction now we are still poorer the country is poorer and I think that's that's an important consideration to when, when we look at other countries that are net exporters of energy. Um, actually, this has been a big, big boost to their terms of trade, and we see that reflected in the differences across countries in real incomes and real consumption. Yeah. In our case, consumption is still way below 2019 levels. If you look at the U.S., for example, yeah. which is a net exporter of energy, Consumption has been running above their pre-COVID trends, so you know it's, it's a divergent uh, yeah. picture, much more different. Yeah. So um, that's very helpful. Thank you. I'm going to ask the mm. chair, mm -hmm. how are we doing for time? I've got more questions, but I'm conscious of others want to get in, Indeed. and we want to move on to other topics. Yeah. What do you think? I think I think I'm going because I know Anthony um, I wants to ask a few yeah. Yeah. things on the labour market, okay. uh, yeah. and then I'll, I'll Come back we'll to bring that. And then I yeah. I don't want to leave without asking about quantitative tightening and easing Indeed. either. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, I was going to ask about um, bonus cap. So this is uh, oh. not not monetary policy committee, but obviously Andrew. Well, Bain I can the jurors, but yeah, I think it's probably coming my way as the as the the, uh, the, the all round top uh, <laughs> banking supervisor. Um, right. So the, the, one of the uh, survivals of the uh, List Trust Premiership is the uh, commitment by the government to scrap the uh, so-called bonus cap. Um, mm. And that was supposedly introduced, obviously the, the UK government at the time didn't support it, but that was supposedly introduced to stop uh, excessive risk-taking in the banking industry. Do you have any concerns about getting rid of it in terms of that will lead to more risk Well, behavior? I mean, I... Uh, I'm ancient enough to have appeared before this committee about a decade ago on this subject. When you were chief executive of the PRA, I, I think. That, well, that's when I was at the, briefly at the FSA and yeah. said that I didn't agree with the bonus cap chief. when it was being uh, introduced as part of European EU legislation. And one of the things I remember saying at the time, sorry, this sounds terribly prescient of me, and I don't want to sound like that, but that I was concerned that it would lead to two things. One is that it would lead to an increase in permanent pay, a substitution from... Uh, from bonus to permanent pay, and two, that it, really, it, you know, it didn't have the right uh, incentives in terms of risk-taking. Um, I think the first of those, and we've published evidence to suggest that the first of those actually has happened. Um, on, on the question of, you know, why, why do we support getting rid of it? Um, well, first of all, it, does, it doesn't have the right incentives. It has led to that. Secondly, as you know, I think we've, you know, we, we've, we've always had a UK, uh, you know, frame of policy framework in place, which remains in place, which has a different uh, sort of thrust to it, and I think is consistent with the right incentives, which is that it involves 
well, several things, but one is deferring deferral, the, and crawl deferral back of and, yeah. the payments out of the of a quite a good proportion of the variable remuneration, and the potential then for what's called malice. Although I often get transcripts back saying it's malice, and we don't have a policy of malice. I would say, <laughs> but, uh, but malice, which is taking it back before it's actually given out, as yeah. it were, and clawback even, which of course goes yeah. beyond that point. The other thing is that we have a policy of saying that we want uh, you know, a large part of the variable remuneration paid in instruments, which are then subsequently you know, reflect risk, uh, not cash, in other words. Um, so we think, you know, our view is that we've got a better policy framework in place and the bonus cap has the wrong, the wrong incentives attached to it. So getting rid of it won't lead to more risky behaviour? No, we don't think short. so, no. Yeah. no. And that's why, I mean, you know, I felt when, when obviously it was advocated by the government, I mean, my view was, look, we take a very consistent line on this. Um, so, you know, so, yeah, our view is very clear on it. I think. Yeah. Uh, the, the, what, another big, or another change that's happening is the to the ring-fencing regime. Uh, yeah. And uh, the, after the ski review has recommended various... Yeah. Um, uh, reforms to it, and we did do a, um, have some questions here of the, the bank CEOs uh, mm. earlier this week, wasn't it? Just a couple of days ago. Um, do you have any concerns about the changes to the ring fencing regime? Do you think uh, there's any? Uh, no, I, th I think the, the, the proposals that Keith Skeok and his uh, his group proposed are uh, sensible. I, you know, I think my whole approach on these sort of areas of policy is that they don't remain, you know, that they shouldn't remain fixed for all time. Actually, they'll become. You know, dangerously not sort of not consistent if they do. So I think the things that Keith has proposed are sensible. Um, I, I, I would also say I know there's been some debate about the relationship between the, the ring fence regime and the, and the um, resolution regime. I see them as complements. They're not substitutes. You know, they're, they're complements. Right. So the, the fact that we've now got a, a, a better recovery regime, I mean, we don't totally know how to work in, you know, in a real crisis, but th that's not an argument for getting rid no, of the I, No, I think ring fencing makes the or would make the execution of a resolution and recovery more straightforward in that sense. My final question on the, uh, as, a, as the prudential regulator uh, is on the uh, Basel 3.1 measures, uh, oh. which are, uh, uh, I think, being consulted on at the moment, that, that uh, will increase the capital requirements for uh, lending to SMEs and uh, UK companies with no formal credit rating and infrastructure projects. And mm -hmm. obviously, under the EU, when the EU came through this originally, they, they effectively reduced the risk weighting for SMEs. Yeah. Um, do, Presumably this would push up the cost of, I mean, it's inevitable, it will push up the cost of lending to SMEs and to infrastructure projects. Well, is, that, is that desirable? We are, one thing and then a bit of history, we are, we are in a consultation, so we want evidence, and we've asked the banks to provide us with their evidence of, of what the measures would do in that sense versus the current thing. So I think the answer to that question, and, and I, you know, I can speak for Sam Woods now, I'm sure, we will be very happy to come to the committee and, and lay out that evidence and put it, put it right to you and put it before you because it's important. Just a bit of history. So in the earlier implementation, in the Basel III implementation, the EU did not implement Basel you know, properly and has been judged by the Basel Committee to be non-compliant. Of course, the UK was a member of the EU at that point, so we had to implement the EU rules. Now, Basel 3.1 amends the SME and infrastructure regimes to reduce the capital yeah. requirements. By the way, actually, that's mostly you know, applied to the standardised approach. Obviously, yeah. if you're on IRB, that's a different, yeah. different matter. For the big banks, it's a different story anyway. Um, so, so, so Basel 3.1 reduces it. So our, you know, our proposal in the consultation is to implement those reduced Basel numbers. The EU, as I say, did a, did a special thing on Basel 3.0, and, in, and you know, we think they intend to continue those and not implement Basel. There's a, you probably read there's quite a dispute now between the regulators and the authorities within the EU on this question. But the key thing is that in the consultation is we want the evidence of you know, how these, these regimes compare and then we'll be able to assess that and we'll be completely transparent about that. So to you, happy to do that. Okay, great. That's my Thank question. you very Thank much, you. Anthony. Uh, Danny. Yeah. Great, thanks. Uh, just, we've discussed earlier the supply side and the inability of interest rate changes to significantly uh, affect or at least affect uh, sort of precise changes there. But, but I would be very interested in your general view, whichever of you want to jump in on this, on, on the challenge that the UK faces. We have this chronic productivity problem in this country. We've never recovered from 2008. And 
in the absence of a lab, any Labour colleagues here, I thought I might ask a slightly political question to you. Uh, I was interested in reports that this reshuffle we've just had and the, and the moving around of ministerial departments, that the, um, the Prime Minister initially offered the science department to Michael Gove. I'm not asking you to off comment on that. Uh, I don't even know if it's true. But what I was struck by was the suggestion that the science department should be see, was a senior new Department of State to the levelling up department. And the implication that what the UK needs most is, you know, a revolution in science and tech rather than the levelling up agenda. I'd just be interested in your views, without getting into the, to the politics of that, please don't feel drawn, but, but in terms of challenging the UK's productivity challenge, would you prioritise, you know, investment, policy, political support into uh, R&D, technology, science, or into the rebalancing of the UK economy to make sure all the regions of the country are growing well. And well, how would you distinguish between those priorities? Lucky enough to have a real expert on the subject here. It's not, it's not me, it's Jonathan. So I'll, don't mind, I'll let Jonathan come in first. It's, it's, it's very kind and very frightening. Uh, a couple of things on this, if I may. So thank, thanks for the question. One is, I've always thought one of the good features of the UK is that actually science policy has been remarkably stable. Mm -hmm. And I can be very non-political about this because I think credit should be given to David Sainsbury, who was on the Labour side, yeah. and David Willits on the, on the Conservative side. The two of them, I think, ensured that a lot of science policy was kind of taken away uh, from the politics of all of this. So, so I, I think that's you know, a, a good part of that. Uh, and we certainly have lots and lots of academic evidence and practical evidence that the, the benefits of having a strong university sector and a strong research base flow quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, well, not, maybe not quickly, but they certainly flow over to the private mm -hmm. sector as well yes. in terms of boosting productivity. So that, that's one set of remarks. Yeah. Second set of remarks is... I, I, I guess the priority would be around investment. So again, if I could take us back to the report in chart 3.7 <laughs> on page 87, mm. you'll have seen that we've got a diagram there um, about investment in the UK. This is business investment, I should say. There are lots of different measures of all that. <laughs> and essentially, business investment was sort of steaming along up until 2016, and unfortunately, it's more or less flatlined um, since then. So... Yes. Uh, the, the one, th if, if I had to sort of boil it all, uh, boil a complicated issue down to one thing, uh, it would be encouraging those types of investment would be. Would but be but would you're say. not particularly interested in where they go. You have a spatially blind attitude to business investment, do you? As long wherever the greatest returns can be realised, rather than thinking about investment in places other than Cambridge, which is yeah, so, so the, the, the issue, wrong with Cambridge. <laughs> so the issue with investment <clears throat> is the. the the investment which is going to give us the biggest bang for our buck in terms of productivity is probably intangible investment. That is to say R&D and design and software and all of those kind of issues. And intangible investment does the best job when it's in a cluster with other like corporations who are also making intangible investment because the R&D scientists can get together with other scientists, the software writers can get together with the movie makers to make the you know CGI stuff and, and all those kinds of things. So I think inevitably, given the cluster benefits from that type of investment, uh, then the benefits of that um, in terms of sort of the immediate kind of overall will be um, concentrated in towns and cities, which takes us then to issues around planning when we sort of worry about policy. Um, yes. Now, of course, once we have this investment and the cake gets bigger, back to the earlier discussion, then society can choose as they wish to uh, distribute the cake, uh, you know, around to whichever parties they want to distribute us. And as Hugh was saying earlier on, that's not a question for us, that's a question uh, uh, for you. When you say distribution, um, do you mean... Through what? Through through welfare? Spending, oh yeah, through, through the tax services. system, through welfare or public services, or or, 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 or whatever. I mean, that feels like the old model, which is that the southeast generates income for the treasury, which it then hands out as sort of compensation to the places which weren't involved in the production of value. In the I, first I'm not. Place. I'm not saying whether that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that because of the characteristics of this rather powerful form of investment, because they, as I say, that they they, they get their most bang for the buck when they're clustered yes. together. Yes. I think inevitably. Uh, those benefits are going to be generated at a quite geographically... Uh, OK, but do you think there's a role for government in in creating or encouraging clusters in new places that not not the traditional centres of of de development and growth? And how effective do you think it would be for government to say we're going to, we're going to create a new sector cluster in a place which hasn't had one traditionally? Well, do you think that's doomed? I, I, 
and Andrew's looking at me because this is not really monetary policy. <laughs> no, 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 no. He's, well, he's an expert on the subject. I, I, so I, I'm, I'm off our narrow brief, but if I could just offer a view. Um, I, th I think there is some benefit in that, but I think what, the, what we know about cluster policy is it takes a very long time. So Stanford University, for example, is an amazing cluster out in Silicon Valley. But, you know, 100 years ago, Stanford, was referred, Stanford University was referred to as the farm. Nobody went there. Mm -hmm. And it was almost an unknown kind of university. Mm -hmm. So these things take a long time to bear fruit. OK. Well, well thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I just, just to finish from you, maybe one for the governor, and this does range rather broadly beyond uh, monetary policy, but it's related. And you might want to comment on, on Brexit in this context, if you like, which is just, and I, and I noticed hearteningly, uh, that the, you think that although there have been undoubted impacts from Brexit in terms of obviously political distraction uh, and significant uncertainty for business, the uh, I think the reduced divergence was the phrase uh, from uh, in terms of uh, growth with trade with the EU versus trade with non-EU countries. So maybe things are looking up. If you would like to uh, comment, I'd be delighted. Or maybe the tr you can uh, conclude that the effects of Brexit are, as you might put it, transitory. transitory. Uh, so any, any thoughts on that? But I, I really want to hear from you on the overall model that, in my view, was rejected by the Brexit vote and by the majority of the country in the first of our conversation just now. For 20 years, we've had an economic model dependent on cheap credit, printing money uh, from the bank, cheap labour from immigration, high immigration policy, and cheap imports due to our strong pound. And all of that, in a sense, has had some benefits to some people, but for the majority of working people in this country, uh, it has not been helpful. And as a result, they voted to change that model, not just to leave the EU. It was a more wholesale rejection of the economic model that we've had for so long. Do you accept that your mission as part of economic policy makers in this country is to help make that decision successful and to make, therefore, to make Brexit work? And how are you doing that? Well, uh, let me say two things to start with. Uh, I, I've said this many times before. Uh, as a public official and a servant, I'm neutral per se on the issue. Mm. The second thing to say is, I've said this many times before, as you rightly say, it was decided by the people in a referendum. It's our job to implement and, and, and where it affects us to, to, you know, to, 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 to implement uh, the policies that follow from it, and that goes back to the discussion we were just having on financial regulation. Actually, so yeah, we are, yeah, we're, we're clear on that. I mean, yeah, that, that's that's yeah. very important. On this question, I mean, you raised uh, about uh, trade. I think we, our staff have done a lot of work with um, ONS and HMRC on the trade data because it's been very, it's been very hard to interpret some of the trade data um, because there's been a shift in the method of collection. Mm. The conclusion of that work is that the effect of Brexit on trade, which we have said for some time we thought would be initially negative, has come through possibly more quickly than we thought it was. doesn't mean so it will be bigger. It just means it come, seems to have come through more quickly. As you rightly said, though, we've, you know, again, we've said for a long time, there will, of course, be, a, over the longer term, an adjustment of the real economy to that. Uh, you know, the, the economy will adjust. That's, that's natural. It will be supported, no doubt, by public policy to do so. So in, in the initial phase, we think it's probably come through rather more quickly based on you know, the, work, the work our staff have done on trade data uh, so far. That's the, that's the only conclusion we have. And we've, we've factored that into the, into the, into the monetary policy assessment because you know, we do believe there's a relationship between openness and productivity. So that productivity, that, that shock to productivity that we've had in our assumptions for some time now hasn't increased, but it has come through probably more quickly. Okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, yeah. So our role in the economy is framed by the remit. So we need to get inflation to 2%. That's, that's our contribution to the economy. Mm -hmm. And the MPC has a, a track record of having achieved that 2% inflation over mm -hmm. its um, 25 years. As we said before, we've been shocked by um, unprecedented shocks, COVID, the war in Ukraine, and so on. And the role of the MPC in that setting is to return inflation to target sustainably. And that's our part. We cannot affect the productive side, the supply side of the economy. That's, um, that's for government uh, to do. Um, our role is to stick to the 2% target in the medium term. Okay. 
Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Danny. And I just want to conclude with the subject of quantitative tightening and quantitative easing, because, uh, as you know, we launched a, an inquiry mm. into that last week. And uh, it was striking, I thought, that in this monetary policy report, you mentioned simply that they exist as tools. You didn't really say anything more about them. Uh, and I just wondered if you did at all discuss them in the meeting itself. Well, our normal practice is to comment on that in the minutes of the meetings, mm. actually, where we do get, obviously, reports from the staff uh, mm. on the operations that have been mm. done where it's got to. Mm. We, yeah, we set a, quant a target for quantitative tightening over a year, uh, so we're not going to vary that target. Mm. So we're not at a point when we, obviously, the committee will have to reconsider that when we get to that point, but we're not at that point at the moment. So uh, the, the operation, the operations, you know, to, to the extent we cover them, it's in the minutes. Mm -hmm. Now, we've been um, conducting those operations now since November, mm -hmm. um, and so far I would say, you know, they've been, you know, very, very smooth in that sense. And you're at 8.27 at the moment, is that right? In yes, terms around of about that, yeah, it's 8 20, somewhere between 8.25 and 8.27, yes. Okay. And then the 19.3 billion that you bought uh, yes. just to stabilise yes. the markets uh, because of the liability-driven yes. investment uh, crisis, uh, which is obviously separate. Those have now all been They've sold. All been sold. Yes. And have you um, found, as a result of being able to sell those, I think it sounds like relatively easily, uh, has that informed uh, what the operational team are doing in terms of the quantitative tightening at the moment? It it has. Mm -hmm. um, we sold the 19, uh, just over 19, using a different um, approach, actually, which was in, in the quantitative tightening guilt operations, we do auctions and mm. you know, we name the amount. We, we, we did the, uh, the 19 plus mm. on a basis of what we call an open book approach, mm. where we set the price and said, you know, what do you want? Yeah. Um, and actually, we sold it very quickly, actually, and we started towards the end of November and were done mid-January, 12th of January, I think was the last one. Now, I, what I would say is this: it, it, it hasn't it hasn't changed our view on how we do the guilt process, uh, auctions process. We've set the objective of eighty billion pounds of reduction, and that's both through the active sales and the, the runoff for the first year. And we will stick to that uh, because it's operating smoothly. It's not disrupting markets. Indeed, I would say markets mm -hmm. are now you know, more stable than they were. Uh, a few months ago, but we will then review it. Uh, now it is we have we have got a second set of sales going on. We're, sell, we're gradually selling off the uh, corporate bond portfolio. That's twenty mm. billion, uh, and we have taken over some of the some of the lessons from the nineteen billion mm. sale process into that sale process as well. You've, you've sold all the corporates. No, no, it's not all no. gone yet. No, no, no. No, out of the twenty. Out of twenty, well, I think we're about forty, forty-five percent of the way. Through at the moment. Through that. Think, okay, but, yeah. and then plus there's the 80 on top of that, and then there's yeah. the 19.3 that you've already yes. done. Uh, and uh, in terms of how that uh, experience now of some quantitative tightening, you know, one of the great unknowns in terms of quantitative tightening yeah. is what it equates to in terms of a monetary tightening, a monetary yes. policy tightening. Are we any more informed on that at this point? You know, he might want to come on this. I don't think we have, um, I mean, we don't have enough systematic evidence uh, yet. Sorry, I thought was, <laughs> so, uh, We don't have any systematic, it's a bit early for that, yeah. frankly. What we, can, what we can observe, I'll just finish off, is obviously market reactions to mm. it. We are not seeing any, uh, what I would call, market disturbance. Uh, you know, we look at the conditions in markets around the auctions. We look at measures of liquidity. So bid ask spreads have come down, for instance, during this period quite a bit. I mean, just I don't have much to add on that. Uh, I mean, I think there has been an emphasis on what Andrew has described and maybe in the way you phrase the questions on, if you like, the operational aspects mm -hmm. of this. Um, I think from a monetary policy point of view, it is a more slow-moving business. Um, we anticipated that because effectively, and reflecting the fact this is not at the front and centre, mm -hmm. the discussion in the monetary policy mm -hmm. report, that quantitative tightening would, if you like, run a little in the background on this lower frequency year-to-year -year basis, not be so much in the month-to-month, meeting-to-meeting -meeting basis, where we would focus on using bank rate as the active instrument. And, of course, now bank rate has moved to a level where we have scope to, scope to move it mm. in either direction, which has been mm. part of the discussion this morning. Mm. Um, so that, if you like, validates this in-the-background mm. approach. 
Uh, I think there are different views on the committee, so I should recognize that. My personal view is I would expect the sale of these bonds to have some effect on market pricing along the yield curve. I think that is very difficult to quantify. Um, and, of course, there are lots of other things influencing the market yield curve. Mm. And I think that should not be a concern for the conduct of monetary policy focusing on the use of bank rate as the active mm. instrument because, as is the case with all our decisions, we condition our monetary policy uh, stance on developments in all aspects of the economy, including asset prices, including the state of the yield curve. So that's the sense in which, um, although it's an interesting kind of academic question, how has quantitative tightening affected the yield curve? From our point of view, because we observe the yield curve, we can still set monetary policy using bank rate. Hugh, you mentioned that transmission mechanism. There's um, also the fact uh, that the quantitative easing, it used to be a profitable exercise for the Treasury and you used to hand back the profits and now you're projecting that there are going to be losses and that the Treasury is going to have to absorb those. Um, So that's another way in which presumably there could be some tightening experience through this change in direction. What I'd say to that is, I mean... What has happened in terms of the cash flows is not a surprise. Um, it was always envisaged mm. that there would be a point at mm. which those cash flows would turn negative. Yeah. Um, and it's really, I think, a fiscal decision, which is a decision more for the Treasury than for us, yeah. to work out how to um, incorporate that in their mm. own fiscal pl- okay. planning, of which this is one part. So it, I would say this probably isn't a monetary policy implication of all these things, but it would be on the fiscal side. But it does tighten fiscal policy, which well, might have a monetary implication. Um, I would be cautious about saying mm-hmm. that because, of course, I mean, through time, uh, we have transferred a lot of money to the Treasury. Uh, all the coupons that we mm-hmm. received um, on the bonds that were held mm-hmm. uh, have already been given to the Treasury. Mm-hmm. So um, what the Treasury did with them, maybe they paid down debt, maybe they spent them. These are things that it's not for me to comment on. That was a fiscal decision. And, of course, um, just as it wasn't for me to comment on Mm. on that side of the operation, I was not at Mm. the bank at the time, but I wouldn't have commented on them anyway. It's not really for us Mm. to comment on the other side. So that is, I think, a fiscal question. It's about £123.8 billion that we transferred over in cash flow. It is. And uh, how does your approach differ, Governor, to the approach taken by the Fed now that they've reached the same inflation point and the European Central Bank? Well, the difference with the Fed is that the Fed has a a much shorter duration book of assets. And the main reason for that is because the U.S. government debt has a much shorter average duration. Mm. U.K. government debt has a longer average duration than many other countries, Mm. which in many ways obviously is a a good thing, actually. And and the bank's decision right at the outset of quantitative easing, going back to 2009, was that we would be neutral in terms of market impact. And Mm. so essentially the board in three buckets, short, medium, long, really to replicate the, the stock of uh, the stock of gilts in, in issue. Um, what that means is that because we've got a longer average duration on the book, um, if we were to rely on the approach the Fed can take, which is is just is passive runoff, so they, you know, it happens very quickly. Uh, obviously, the process would take a much longer time. Um, and that's really what has led us to, therefore, to, to conduct active sales, uh, which is different from certainly the, the Fed's approach. If I can make one more point, so just it might be useful. Just I'm just happy to come back in your in, in the inquiry, which, by the way, I think is, I'm very much welcome. The fact that you're doing this, I think it's important to you know, keep this keep this under review. In terms of the total stock of assistance that we apply, we, we, we provide, and, and 825 is a, as you said earlier, is, a, is not a bad way of looking at it. We will not take it down to zero because we can't because there's a demand, there's, there's an equilibrium demand for reserves in the in, in the banking system um, because reserves are the is the, the other side of the balance sheet. Um, now we don't know what that equilibrium level is because um, all I can t- I can tell you two things. One is the number we have at the moment is higher than it is, and the number we had before the financial crisis was way too low. Yeah. You know, it will settle at some point. Um, we will then have to decide um, what the right, in a sense, mix of short-term repos and outright holdings is to match that. 
So we will have a decision to take, and the other Treasury will have to be part of that decision. Um, but I just want to caution that the idea we'll sell from 8.25 to zero, mm. uh, that's not. Yeah. No. And there will have to be an adjustment done at that point, but I just bear that in yeah. mind. No, and uh, we, we obviously will take more evidence on yeah. this because uh, this is uh, going to be a topic of, of, of yeah. interest to the wider committee. But I think uh, at this point... Um, I am just going to thank you for your time. Sure. I think that it has been uh, extremely interesting to explore the thinking behind where we are, um, the role of hindsight versus contemporary evidence that there were to, of the risks to the upside on inflation. And, you know, just speaking personally at the end of the session, I still think the factors that led to uh, an upside surprise on inflation are potentially still with us in terms of the secondary effects in the economy. And I know that you note that in your monetary policy report. Um, inflation is the worst tax that we can inflict on the economy and it hurts the poorest the most and uh, therefore I just would conclude by urging you to remain extremely vigilant about those becoming more embedded uh, in the UK economy uh, and so thank you very much for your time you. order order I declare this session over thank you thank you very much indeed thank you very thank you to my two